This presentation is part of a series of presentations on infection control in care homes. The key outcomes are to understand how infections are spread and to understand how to prevent the spread of infection by understanding the core elements of standard infection control precautions. Also, to understand the key principles of reducing the spread of viral gastroenteritis in care homes. The first four presentations focus on the core elements of standard infection control precautions. The first focuses on cleanliness and decontamination. The second focuses on bloodborne viruses and the management of inoculation injuries. The third focuses on the use of personal protective equipment. The fourth, fourth focuses on hand hygiene. Standard infection control precautions should be applied in all healthcare settings to reduce the risk of infections to patients, residents and staff. The fifth focuses on the key principles for reducing the spread of viral gastroenteritis in care home settings. This presentation focuses on reducing the risk of acquiring infection from bloodborne viruses and the management of inoculation injuries. The important bloodborne viruses are shown on this slide. Hepatitis B and C cause hepatitis, an inflammation of the liver which can be very serious. HIV may lead to acquired immune deficiency syndrome, commonly known as AIDS. Some people who have these viruses may not know that they are carriers and you cannot tell without testing the person whether they have the virus or not. Therefore, it is important to take precautions when dealing with the blood and body fluid from all people. In people who have hepatitis B, hepatitis C and HIV, the viruses may be found in their blood, cerebral spinal fluid, pericardial fluid and pleural fluid. The most high risk body fluid is blood or any other blood stained body fluid. The viruses can also be found in synovial fluid, amniotic fluid and the vaginal and cervical secretions of those who have the virus. HIV can be passed on through the breast milk of mothers who have the virus. Transmission in the clinical environment is rare. Patient to patient transmission of these viruses is very rare and could occur by the sharing of equipment that has not been decontaminated properly. Staff may acquire infection from patients, for example following a needle stick injury from a person who has one of the viruses. Staff who have one of these viruses may pass it on to a patient. For example, if a member of staff had one of the viruses and sustained an injury, the virus might be passed on to a patient during a procedure. Inoculation injuries expose the injured person to blood and body fluid which may or may not be infected with bacteria and viruses which could lead to infection. The transmission of bloodborne viruses may happen in one of two ways. The highest risk exposure is a percutaneous injury. This is when the skin is broken and can happen because of a needle stick injury, bite, scalpel injury or any other injury with a sharp instrument. Of these, injuries with hollow blow needles and blood carry the greatest risk. The second way the viruses can be passed on is from a splash of infected blood or body fluid to the eyes, nose, mouth or any other area of non-intact skin. Hepatitis B is the most infectious of the viruses. One in three people who have a needle stick injury with hepatitis B infected blood may seroconvert and may develop hepatitis. All staff who work in clinical practice should have been vaccinated for hepatitis B. One in 30 people who get a needle stick injury with hepatitis C infected blood may seroconvert and may develop hepatitis. And one in 300 people who have a needle stick injury with HIV infected blood may seroconvert and may develop HIV. To date, there is no vaccination for hepatitis C or HIV. In order to reduce the risk of these viral infections being passed on, 
You should adopt standard practices. These should be used routinely and universally with all people in all situations and in all areas to minimise the spread of germs that may cause infections, including the bloodborne viruses, between patients and staff. These precautions should be done irrespective of the perceived risk of infection of the person you are caring for. The risk of sharps injury can be reduced by avoiding the use of sharps whenever possible and by always placing used sharps in a proper sharps box. They should not be placed in refuse bins or jars and you should never leave them lying around. You shouldn't resheath needles. There is always a risk of getting a needle stick injury if you do this. Don't pull the needle off the end of the syringe. Always discard the needle and syringe as a single unit. The less you handle the needle, the less likely you are to get injured. Always discard sharps at the point of care. Take a small sharps box with you and get rid of needles as soon as you use them. This is safer than carrying used sharps through your department to dispose of in another area. This slide shows procedure trays that can also be used to carry a small sharps box so that sharps can be disposed of at the point of the procedure. It is the responsibility of the person who uses the sharp to dispose of it. Sharps bin should always be positioned optimally, preferably at waist level or wall mounted. Don't place them under a worktop and don't place them on the floor or on a wall mounted so high that you can't see the opening of the bin. Use the right size bin. Using too small a bin can lead to overfilling, which is a risk for needle stick injury. Make sure to build the bin correctly. Make sure that the lid is on safely to prevent accidental spillages. And don't overfill the bin. This can lead to needle stick injuries. You should close it when it's two thirds to three quarter full. Sign and label the bin when you assemble it, when you close it, and when you dispose of it. Make sure it's closed properly before placing it out for collection. Make sure that sharp spins are kept out of the reach of confused people and any visiting children. This slide shows a bin that is over full. It has a sharp which has not been disposed of correctly and is sticking out of the opening of the bin. It could cause an injury. It is well worth checking the opening of a sharp spin carefully before you place any sharps in it in case a sharp object is sticking up through the opening. This slide shows a sharp spin that hasn't been built properly. Sharps could easily spill from this bin and cause injury to anyone handling it. All staff should ensure that the hepatitis B vaccination is up to date. And they should also know what to do if they get an injury. If you are unlucky enough to get an injury, you should never ignore the injury. If you've had a needle stick or other sharp injury, you should stop what you're doing and take immediate action. You should actively encourage bleeding from the injury under running water. You should wash the site thoroughly with soap and water and you should cover the injured area with a waterproof dressing. If you've had a splash injury, you also need to stop what you were doing and take immediate action. You should rinse out the area with lots and lots of water. For both types of injury, you should also inform your manager and complete an incident form. You should also know how to get the relevant tests and follow up. Any blood spillages and soiling should be dealt with by disinfecting the area with a chlorine releasing product at 10,000 parts per million. This slide shows a blood on a blood glucose testing machine. This could be a route of transmission for bloodborne viruses. 
This slide also shows equipment that has blood on it, which may be a source of infection. When handling waste and linen, remember it presents a risk to others. Dispose of it according to your local protocols. When you handle waste and linen, you should always wear protective clothing in order to protect yourself. Always swan neck the bags and tag them to indicate where they came from. The bags must be kept safely in a secure area whilst awaiting collection. On no account should sharps be placed in waste bags or in linen bags. All waste should be segregated according to the new colour coding and segregation regulations. Consequently, domestic type waste should be placed in black bags. Infectious waste should be placed in orange bags. And non-infectious, offensive hygiene waste should be placed in tiger stripe bags. You should always use alginate bags for linen contaminated with blood or body fluid and for linen which is thought to be infectious. Alginate bags are water-soluble bags that allow staff who work in laundries to place them directly into a washing machine and so reduce the risk of infection to staff. You should always dispose of your used linen by using colour-coded bags according to your local protocol. This slide shows leakage from a waste bag because someone has placed a sharp object into the bag. The bag has been pierced and body fluid is leaking onto the floor. Every day in work, remember to regard all the people you look after as if they might be potentially infected and therefore potentially a risk to you. Any procedures involving blood or body fluid should be regarded as high risk. And remember to maintain those standards at all times, even when it's really busy. If you always use standard precautions, they will help to keep you and the people you look after safe because you will be treating and caring for all people in the same safe way. Further information is available in the Public Health Wales publication, Communicable Disease Control, a Guide for Care Staff. And remember that infection control is everyone's business and everyone has a role to play in protecting your residents.